I, I think a part of the challenge for me has been, you know, what is a, uh, two sides, what does a Christian really need to grow? You know, and we just keep saying that, well, what they need is more Bible study, more Bible study, more Bible study. And, um, or they need to, you know, have more programs and more programs. And, you know, in my experience, I think all the research validates this, is that the only thing that helps a person grow is their own desire to change. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that I can never cause or force someone else to change. But I can help people who are determined to change, change. And, and so part of it to me is that we, we keep creating, coddling Christians and, and, and then condemning non-Christians rather than creating a space where people without Christ experience unconditional love and, and are surprised by our graciousness and then calling those who follow Christ to serve because healing really does come in serving. And I know in my own life, the more I, I served other people, the more I was healed myself. Mm -hmm. The more I can get people to stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about others, the better they get themselves. Is that the best explanation for the person you've become? Because you shouldn't be this person. Mm -hmm. uh, and some may be meeting you for the first time. You mentioned not knowing your father. Uh, your path could have taken such a different course. Uh, yeah, it really could have, and I think at times it was <laughs> taking a very different course. And you know, I, I, I um, I'm a really happy person. Uh, I mean, I enjoy life really deeply and profoundly. Um, but I am not a stranger to pain, and um, and there's always like this little sub narrative in my soul of the part of me that was so despairing and so broken. Um, and and, I, and I, I do think that's part of the reason why my talks on Sunday are, I guess, you know, two-fifths therapeutic. You know, because the moment you connect to the real pain in your own soul, you begin to connect to the pain in, in the lives of others. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I, you can't help people if you're drowning in your own tar pit. And, and, and so I feel like the part of me that connects to others is the part where there's, there's been real pain and brokenness. But the part of me that actually helps people is the fact that I'm not stuck there. That there is real hope and real joy and real, um, in, uh, I'm going to use this shallow word, happiness, you know, that I just enjoy life so deeply and so profoundly. And uh, so I'm really grateful for life, you know. There are moments, like my, my wife, Kim, she's so awesome. And, you know, some days, like, I, I end up struggling more, like, significantly with, like, OCD and different things like that. And, <laughs> and she'll say, stop that, stop that. You know, you don't have to do that. I know, honey, I just do this because I like it or, you know, and, and, and so there are moments where I, I all of a sudden I'm 12 again and I find myself struggling with some of the same stuff I struggled with when I was young. And, but I, I just see them as like now as like fresh reminders that I really was that messed up person. Because sometimes I look back and go, was that really me? You know, do I, am I remembering that right? Could I have possibly been that dysfunctional and that shattered as a human being? And so I think the moments where I struggle with stuff from the past, it's just a very healthy uh, reconnection to the fact that I've changed so much mm -hmm. and I've been healed from so much. And, and for that, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And you were one creative explosion. And I'm wondering now at McManus.LA, yeah. the jeans, the bag, I, I, there's a journal oh, yeah, in that that's bag. Right. And uh, now, is that just a nice design, or is that something you're really encouraging because it's been something meaningful in your journey? Yeah, I, I, I can pretty much assure you that there's nothing I do that doesn't have some inherent meaning behind it, and uh, almost a compulsive meaning mm -hmm. behind it. And um, when I started the company three years ago, when I started the bags and the films, I actually, the first project I thought I would accomplish was creating a journal. Uh, it's taken me three years. This is not a five-minute process. A long time to really figure out how to do this effectively well. Those and, aren't just blank pages. No, by they're the not. Way. <laughs> it's it's actually what I would call a guided journal. It's a it's a journal that takes you on a journey, and I I, I pack this thing with um, story and um, imagery and quotes and um, and and uh, they're they're all really statements that have guided me through this particular process. And, and even the typesetting is, is done kind of uniquely and it's fun and, and it takes you on a journey. And there's a reason for this. 
when, uh, when I wrote Uprising over 10 years ago, I, I, I took three chapters and talked about the process from brokenness to wholeness. And one of the things I really delineate there is how when I it was in my deepest state of brokenness, there were about five memories that owned me. They controlled my life, and I kept thinking about those memories over and over and over again. In fact, my whole life was defined by those experiences. These are derailing kind of They were memories. destructive and painful yeah. and dark memories. And it, and it left me in, in a state of depression for years and years and years. And, and somewhere around the age of 15 or 16, I, I'm not really sure what happened, but I, I came to this realization that I was going to come to the end of my life if I didn't change my internal narrative. And so around the age of 15, I began reconstructing my memories. Now, I'm not making up memories, but painfully going through the process of finding some positive, hopeful memories from my childhood and forcing myself to begin to remember them rather than the other memories. And, and then I began to consciously begin to build positive memories in my life, doing things that gave me a sense of aliveness, of hope, of meaning. And, and a lot of it did come in serving other people and just getting myself out of my own hell, my own head and getting myself out of my own desperation and, and focusing on, on others or something else. And, um, and so I, I accidentally stumbled on this dynamic that what I experienced wasn't as powerful as what I remembered. Mm. And, and then just a, a couple of years ago, I heard Daniel Kahneman, um, I think he's a social scientist, um, talking about his research on what they described as the experienced self and the remembered self. And when I heard him, I, I was stunned because I'd never heard anyone describe the human internal experience the way that I thought about it. And he said that what they found is that our experienced self, what we've actually experienced in life, has almost no relationship to our personal happiness. It's actually our remembered self that has everything to do with our personal happiness. And, and, and just to summarize, what you experience in life doesn't determine whether you're happy or depressed. Someone who had more painful experiences than you may be actually more happy than you. Mm -hmm. It's actually your remembered self. It's how you remember your experiences. It's your interpretation of, of those experiences. Your distillation. And when I heard that thought, I've got to finish these journals. Because the whole idea behind the journal was to help a person learn how to create a remembered self that is optimistic, that's hopeful, and that leans into the future. And so with every journal, I wanted to create around a theme of, of who we can become as human beings. So this first one's called The Artisan. And it's really built around this conviction that, that life is a work of art and that everyone is creative. And that the most important work of art that you need to take care of is you and your life and your story and your future. And if you can begin to realize that life is a work of art, you can actually begin to have a greater sense of empowerment and, uh, and freedom and that God created you this way. And so this one is all about taking a person through a journey into their own artistic sense, their own creativity, their own beauty. And, um, and uh, I, I'm just excited about it because there's so many people who've asked me for help. Even today, you know, we, I, I spoke for a little while, and the line's a mile long, and such painful stories, and people broken down and so weeping. So much healing needed. And, and inside of me, I go, I wish I could help every single person, but I know I can't be there for everyone. But one of the wonderful things you can do with something like a journal or a book is that you can be there, in a sense, for a person when they're most open for change. So I'm hoping these guided journals will be a way of helping people um, remember their story, tell their story, and in a sense, uh, write a, a, a new story for their own lives. And you say, the life you long to live is not waiting in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's not waiting for you in the sense that it's um, already happened. It's waiting for you to create it. And, and uh, you know, when I, when I look at the scriptures, the, the first central narrative is the garden. Uh, two trees, you know, that are significant in, in the choices that were laid before them, but an endless array of trees. The first command in the Bible is to eat freely. They could eat from any tree as much as they wanted. No carbs, no fat, you know, and they were naked and unashamed. Imagine a world where you could eat all you wanted and still be comfortable being naked. And, uh, you know, there, <laughs> what was, a thought. Yeah, there was only one tree that was a negative choice. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else was good. And, and yet the central Hebraic metaphor is that God created humanity with free will, with the power to choose. And they could either choose life or choose death. 
choose a life in God or choose a life apart from God. And I'm reminded from the very first steps of human history that the choices we make today create the future we live tomorrow. And I think somehow along the way, we, we've created an apathetic, passive, paralytic theology that says that everything is already predestined and you have no choice in the matter. There's nothing new under the sun. There you go. And I'm going, no, every day I can choose to love. Every day I can choose to forgive. Every day I can choose a life of honor and nobility and generosity. And, you know, I've been married 28 years and it's not accidental because every day for 28 years I've chosen to be faithful to my wife. And those choices didn't happen to me. They are choices that I made and they had an effect on the world I live in. We can start choosing now. I even love the name of your, I don't even think you call it a church, but mosaic. Yeah. Broken pieces brought together. In fact, it's an art piece of broken and fragmented pieces that are brought together by the hand of an artist to create something beautiful, especially when light strikes through it. And when I say, look, we're, we're just all messed up people. We're just broken and fragmented people brought together by the master plan of God to create something beautiful, especially when his light strikes through us. And that's the power of community. It's not about perfection. It's about beauty. Erwin McManus, every word, every moment ignites something in our hearts. And it's been great yeah. to have this time with you. It's wonderful to be with you guys. And thank you for doing uh, credible uh, Christian television with authenticity, integrity, and transparency. It's really refreshing.